Welcome, everyone. It's a pleasure to introduce this next section. I am Andrea Harrison, the chair of the Liebler Society on the Law of Armed Conflict, who's putting this panel on today. Um, the, the panel is uh, entitled Civilian Harm Mitigation in Urban Areas, a Wargaming Exercise. Um, last year, as many of you know, Lieber hosted a series of webinars on civilian harm mitigation, um, all of which are still available on ASIL's YouTube page. Um, but we thought that we would change things up for the annual meetings and uh, provide you with a, an example of a wargaming exercise in which um, we can demonstrate how the law uh, is actually applied in practice. Um, the panelists represent many of our various uh, constituents in the Libra Society, including US military lawyers, foreign military lawyers, and civil society. Um, and so we tried to make this as realistic as possible, but of course, um, within the parameters of a, a remote Zoom session. A special thanks to Jeff Korn for providing the initial inspiration for the scenario we're gonna see today, and to Ian Embrasier for helping shape it um, for this format. A brief narrative of the scenario has been provided on the page if you scroll down. Um, I'm going to introduce the panelists now and give uh, disclaimers on their behalf because we would like to, them to jump in in character for the, the war game. Um, so I, I will just do that now for them. And, but just to let you know that after the panel ends, the live stream ends, um, you can stick around for a, sort of a live Q&A, continue the conversation and chat with the panelists um, during that session as well. So we hope you'll do that. We also hope if you enjoy this panel today, you'll consider joining the, the Libra Society. So our uh, main war game facilitator today is Lindsay Rodman. She is the executive director of the Leadership Council for Women and National Security and an officer and judge advocate in the US Marine Corps Reserve. Uh, the opinions she presents here are neither hers nor those of the US Marine Corps. She will be playing the role of Lieutenant Colonel Rodman in the scenario and will be in command of the infantry battalion conducting the military engagement in our uh, imaginary Lieberville. Ian Brazier serves as an assistant general counsel at the US Department of Homeland Security, and he formerly served as a Marine Corps judge advocate and legal advisor within the International Committee of the Red Cross. Ian will be playing the role of Major Brazier, the US Marine Corps legal advisor deployed to Lieberville to advise Lieutenant Colonel Rodman regarding, regarding US legal obligations. Um, our final military uh, participant is squadron leader Kieran Tinklin, Tinkler, apologies. Um, he is a legal officer with the Royal Air Force and currently a military professor at the Stockton Center for International Law at the U.S. Naval War College. Any views expressed by squadron leader Tinkler are offered in his personal capacity and do not represent those of the Royal Air Force, the U.K. Ministry of Defense, or the U.K. government. Squadron leader Tinkler will be playing the role of the U.K. legal advisor, and he will be responsible for making sure the operation respects any legal obligations of U.K., coalition forces providing artillery and air force support to US forces during this operation in Libreville. Andrea, Andrea Prazow is the deputy Washington director at Human Rights Watch, and she will be playing the part of herself uh, at the Human Rights Watch uh, research as a human re rights researcher and advocate, sorry about that, on the ground in Libreville. Mark Lenning um, will be joining her as the other civil society member. He is a senior protection advisor at the Center for the Protection of Civilians in Armed Conflict, CIVIC. Um, prior to joining CIVIC, he was a delegate of the International Committee of the Red Cross. And Mark will be playing himself as a um, the senior advisor uh, at CIVIC. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Lieutenant Colonel Rodman. All right, good afternoon. Major Brazier and Squadron Leader Tinkler, as you know, we will attack the enemy in Southern Libreville in the next 48 hours. I have really benefited from our great legal discussions throughout our battalion's deployment, and this upcoming mission is of critical importance. I'd like you to join me during my meeting with a few of the humanitarian organizations to get their thoughts about the humanitarian challenges they see as we push into Southern Libreville. I'm fairly certain everyone knows this attack is coming as the Southern part of the city is one of the last enemy holdouts. I'm comfortable discussing the humanitarian aspects of the attack broadly. And of course, we're gonna keep the precise operational details of the attack out of the discussion to protect our operational security. Once the humanitarian representatives leave, let's do a stay behind. I wanna get your final legal guidance on the attack. And I'd also like to get your thoughts on their suggestions for our final planning. So before they join us, let me take a minute and update you from this morning's briefing. The enemy has about 150 fighters located in defensive positions. Most of the buildings in the city are two to four stories constructed of concrete. The enemy has transformed numerous buildings into strong points, and intelligence indicates that the enemy has prevented civilians from evacuating, 
And based on past practice, the enemy does not wear uniforms and will intermingle with civilians in an effort to shield themselves from attack. The enemy is capable of reinforcing their forces with units located south of the city. They utilize the main bridge and road transportation on the largest road that runs through the area. My plan is to use Company A as our battalion's main effort for this attack. I want to clear the enemy as rapidly as possible and cut off all ingress and egress routes in the southern portion of the city to prevent enemy withdrawal or reinforcement. To set these conditions, I plan to in initiate two simultaneous actions. As Company A approaches the buildings the enemy has fortified, I will initiate an attack with mortars, artillery, and air support against the enemy's strong points in the city. This is a shock and awe effort to hold them in place and allow our company to advance. When the company gets close enough, I will cease the mortar, artillery, and airstrikes so soldiers can locate close with and destroy the enemy forces. At the same time, the mortars, artillery, and air support begin in the city. I also intend to destroy the main bridge with artillery and airstrikes. I want road traffic into and out of the southern portion of the city shut off. This will ensure the enemy is cut off from reinforcement from their forces to the south and prevent the enemy from escaping. I'm not crazy about taking out the bridge, but I'm not sure I like our other alternatives. Humanitarian aid organizations have indicated that they are prepared to enter Libreville once it's clear to provide humanitarian assistance, but they do not have any capability to rebuild the bridge. The only alternative to taking it out is to request a platoon of armored vehicles from 2nd Battalion, who as you know is currently engaged in ongoing operations um, and asking them to encircle the bridge to prevent passage. I'm not inclined to ask them for support. Doing so will degrade current operations and subject company A to the risk of enemy attack from the south and force the company to sort out enemy personnel intermingled with civilians trying to flee the village. So with that briefing, do you all have any questions before we bring in the humanitarians? All right. Great, thank you gentlemen. All right, let's bring in uh, Human Rights Watch and Civic and get their thoughts. They're close to the civilian population in Libreville and may have some information that we don't have. Mark and Andrea, can you hear me all right? Yes, we can. Good morning, uh, Lieutenant Colonel. How are you? Great, great. It's really great to see you, and thanks so much for coming. Oh, well, thanks for thank you very much for for agreeing to see us. Um, I think it's uh, it's only forty eight hours before this planned attack, and of course, in an ideal scenario, we have uh, have had a would have had more opportunities to talk already. But it's really appreciated you taking the time. Um, as you know, Civic Human Rights Watch, ICRC, and the and other humanitarian organizations have been uh, working in Libreville, um, have been looking at protection issues, working directly also with the uh, civilian population and civil society. Um, so obviously um, we are uh, really trying to see um, how best uh, can they be protected. And so this is a great opportunity to do so. Um, maybe before delving in into the, to the specifics, uh, we were wondering to what extent um, you have already lessons learned from your previous operations uh, up in the north and in Libreville. Um, because um, with, with the civilian population still residing uh, in the city as we speak today uh, and knowing and assuming that they also really live in close proximity to the enemy that you intend to attack, we're obviously very concerned about uh, issues linked to distinction, how you can really differentiate between uh, combatants um, and the civilian population that is protected, civilians that are not directly participating in hostilities. Um, so maybe you can tell us a little bit about how how you have maybe reached out already to the civilian population, how you have been able to incorporate um, those lessons learned into your planning, into your SOPs, rules of engagement, uh, et cetera, because um, obviously there's a lot to, to learn from those civilians as well. Um, we also understand um, that you have maybe other strategic objectives um, that we are so far not aware of. So obviously, um, we'd like to remind you, of course, that no matter how the, uh, the situation evolves, no matter what the enemy does, that the principles of distinction, proportionality, and precautions need to be applied. Um, so maybe you can share some more thoughts about that. Sure, happy to do so. Obviously, much of our military planning is classified, um, but we still really appreciate your feedback and want this to be a really constructive dialogue. To address your concerns in terms of lessons learned in the North, we have robust processes in place regarding pattern of life observation and positive identification that we use in all of our missions to make sure that we understand who we are targeting and that we are aiming solely at en enemy objectives. Um, in this scenario, we're of course looking at some obvious targets like the main bridge, but I really am open to this discussion and welcome your expertise regarding Libreville. I also want to kick it to Major Brazier. I think he's got um, some lessons learned to share it as well from the legal perspective that might be helpful to you all. Yeah, hey Mark, it's, uh, it's uh, Major Brazier. Listen, uh, good to see you again. Um, as you know, um, Lieutenant Colonel Rodman's battalion has been engaged in combat operations throughout Lieberville, mostly in the north, 
over the past couple of months. So the um, the intermingling between combatants and civilians is something that we're accustomed to dealing with. Uh, this operation may be a little bit different in a few respects uh, that, that we won't go into, um, but but we're used to doing this. But um, so, you know, I think Lieutenant Colonel Rodman brought up two uh, aspects that we incorporate in all of our uh, attacks as much as we can, and that's a pattern of life analysis. A lot of time that is done through unmanned aerial systems, uh, through our manned aerial uh, aviation assets. Um, through, um, you know, other intelligence collection capacities. But ultimately, when it comes down to an attack uh, like the one that is going to occur soon in southern Libreville, you know, we really do rely upon the good training that our uh, soldiers have gone through um, and their experience uh, during the previous combat operations here. And, you know, it does come down to uh, one last thing that Lieutenant Colonel Rodman mentioned was positive identification. You know, no surprise that that is defined as a reasonable certainty that the target is a lawful military objective. And that's a standard of reasonableness, not of perfection. So uh, so thanks, uh, thanks, ma'am. Appreciate that. Back to you, Mark. Thank you, uh, Major Brazier. Good to see you indeed again. And I understand that you're also maybe looking at the, the, the main bridge, um, of course, uh, in, uh, in, 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 in southern, uh, southern Libreville. So it'd be interesting to, to hear more about your planning there. Um, just maybe um, on a more general point still, of course, uh, be, we'd be curious to understand if there's any, any precautionary measures, um, including in terms of being able to warn the civilian population about this impending attack. Um, have you been able to do so? Obviously, it's not always easy in such a scenario. Um, but um, we do, of course, recommend that you have kind of efficient and effective warning mechanisms to allow uh, civilians to, to temporarily evacuate, to hide, um, maybe also give them advice in terms of evacuation routes or first aid stations that you would be setting up, uh, especially uh, in the absence of us, because during the, 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 the kind of intense fighting, we obviously will be very limited in our abilities to, to, to help the civilian population. So it'd be interesting to see uh, what, you're, what, you're think, uh, what you're thinking is, is on that. Um, and then maybe looking at, at that bridge that, uh, that was mentioned, um, we were wondering to what extent have you uh, taken into consideration the, the, the effect that will have if you destroy it, if you really think there is sufficient military advantage to destroy the bridge. Um, but of course, looking at its use also maybe uh, to, to, to supply the, the, the city with water, with electricity, uh, to serve as an evacuation route and to bring in goods um, while we are, uh, of course, uh, not able to do so in any other way. That would be interesting to hear you on uh, as well. Right. No, these are all very important considerations and um, and really helpful in terms of guiding our thinking. I assure you that our attorneys and I are going to make take your suggestions quite seriously. Um, we'll discuss internally your question about warnings to the population, um, and uh, and we're aware that word is out about this um, incoming impending assault. You're aware of it as well. Um, and we'd appreciate your help uh, getting the word out to the population to the extent that you're talking to um, key leaders. To address your questions about the bridge in particular, um, our targeting packages are quite detailed um, and we do take into aspect all aspects of the target, uh, into account all aspects of the target as we're making our targeting decisions. Um, but we also welcome more information. So we'll make sure that we double check that question about water um, and utilities uh, through the bridge. Um, on the question of warning the civilian population, maybe I'll uh, kick it back over to Major Brazier again. He um, has a couple of leaflets that he can share with you that uh, maybe will give you a sense of how we hope to communicate with the civilian population. Hey, thanks, ma'am. Yeah, so Mark, uh, your, uh, your, your concerns about precautions pertaining to uh, warnings uh, are, are well received, and we know that's an important element uh, of advance of our uh, attack in the South. So a couple of things, and you probably have seen these floating around as you and Andrea uh, move around uh, move around the space, is we have one flyer that we put out which uh, provides uh, the Libreville uh, population a particular radio station frequency where they can tune into information uh, about uh, things that they're going to want to hear about, uh, potential evacuation routes. So um, we factored this warning in. Um, also, another one, you know, that's more a, a visual depiction that you uh, civilians um, 
uh, really need to separate themselves from some of the, uh, the armed group leadership and some of the fortified positions that the enemy has set up in Southern Lieberville. So, um, you know, I, I know you appreciate this, um, you know, that the requirement of the law of armed conflict is for effective warnings to civilians unless the circumstances uh, do not permit. Um, and uh, so I think we've, we've kind of accomplished that and we'll certainly factor that in uh, before this, uh, this obvious attack in Southern uh, Libreville goes forward. So barring any questions, thanks, thanks so much. Yeah, um, maybe um, I, I think my my colleague Andrea um, has has more more detailed um, concerns also regarding distinction and the situation of the city, Albertor. Thanks so much, and Lieutenant Colonel Rodman, Major Brazier. I really want to commend you first of all on the, this best practice of consulting with human rights and humanitarian organizations at the outset. We're really pleased that you've taken this step. No guarantee that that will improve the outcomes, but it's really important that we have this open dialogue. So I hope this is the first of many conversations. Uh, I wanted to highlight, you know, just in response to your, your warnings, Major Brazier, I want to bring up some of the comments that, that Mark made already. And as you noted, the requirement is to provide an effective warning. So this is where we'd really be asking how effective have these warnings been in the past? And I'm going to be completely frank here. As you know, we have often criticized the assessment of civilian harm after the fact. So my question for you would be, in previous operations, do you feel that your assessment of civilian harm was accurate so that you can assess whether those warnings were indeed effective and then apply those, those lessons to this particular operation. I also wanna highlight one of the challenges of using warnings in a situation where, as you've noted, the civilian population is closely embedded with the fighting population. So, you know, in part for that reason, we would strongly advise against the use of certain types of weapons, explosive weapons with wide area effects, such as the heavy artillery, heavy mortars, uh, and airstrikes that you've identified you might potentially use in this kind of operation. Um, those can destroy enemy strong points, but those strong points may be embedded within civilian dwellings. Civilians may be in close proximity, uh, even if they're not being used as human shields. This again goes to the effectiveness of the warning, but also their, their ability and desire to leave the area if the fighters are closely embedded within the civilian population. Um, if you haven't done this already, we would strongly advise you set up a deconfliction process with humanitarian actors on the ground, including the Red Cross, to ensure that there can be medical and uh, evacuations and care even during the combat, because of course that, um, that may occur. Um, and we can certainly help you connecting to some of those community leaders and the local population and other humanitarian actors on the ground. Yeah, let me, uh, thanks, Andrew, for that. Let me just say a few things. Um, how effective our warnings have been in the past. Um, you know, we have a robust uh, information operations uh, cell at the, uh, the division level, uh, which is not at our level at the battalion. It's a couple of levels up. Uh, but we have our liaison personnel there. And, um, you know, it's important that we have effective warnings, uh, how effective they have been. Uh, I think we've been pretty happy that that the civilian population knew at, at the appropriate time, uh, not taking away Lieutenant Colonel Rodman's, you know, interest in, in, in tactical surprise, which is a little uh, a legitimate um, interest that she has. Uh, I think they they have been as effective as they can be, but I don't want to like flip flip the the script here, um, Andrea and Mark. Is that um, the enemy here is placed uh, the civilians at risk, um, not the U.S. forces and the coalition forces, and and uh, the law of armed conflict um, assigns certain obligations to every uh, organ, you know, every fighting unit. And um, just because the enemy here um, is mixing purposefully with the civilian population to avoid the coalition attacks, um, they're primarily responsible. And we certainly factor that in and their irresponsibility, their violations of the law of armed conflict do not absolve us of our obligations to, to make sure that we are distinguishing civilians from combatants and their uh, respective property. Uh, using proportionality, which, uh, as you know, is an excessive, really an excessive force requirement. And then uh, third, a lot of we've been talking about is we, we painstakingly go through a lot of the precautions. So I, I just offer that. And thanks for your question. 
And I'll, I'll also yeah. add to your to your question about um, battle damage assessment. That is a core part of our standard operating procedures. We would not engage in any kind of effort like this without having thoroughly planned to assess what kind of um, damage we do after the fact. And if we do end up with civilian casualties, which I hope we do not, and our goal is to end up with none, um, then uh, we will certainly uh, do what we can to report out what we can. But internally, we will have a full assessment of the impact of our mission. Um, I assure you that is that is a part of our standard operating procedure at this point. Thanks for that. You know, Major Brazier, you bring up a really important point, which is uh, the opposing party's conduct. And to the extent possible, we have conversations with, with all warring parties and bring up their own obligations. So while they may be violating the laws of war, um, that's a conversation for, for a different day. We're here to talk about the obligations that, that your forces have. And you brought up the issue of distinction, which is really an essential one in this environment, as you know. Um, this is a, a densely populated urban environment where it may be quite difficult for your forces to distinguish between civilians and combatants. There are many people who are supportive of the fighting forces, but are not actually lawful targets. Some people may be those proverbial farmers by day and fighters by night, uh, while others are actually engaged in direct participation in hostilities. We recognize it may be very difficult to determine, particularly in the heat of battle, who is whom, um, but we really urge you to ensure that you are making the appropriate assessment and that you are only targeting civilians who might be directly participating in hostilities. If they have stopped participating, if they have you know, hung up their weapons and, and gone home, and if they're not performing a continuous combat function, they are not targetable. And we recognize how difficult it will be and the targeting actions are really challenging. Um, but we also really urge you to think about the impact on civilians, not only this, the immediate harm to civilians from these actions, but the ongoing harm to the civilian population based on, uh, on what, what might happen here. So the battle damage assessment that you've identified, of course, is important, but we really hope that you're setting the stage for fully assessing civilian harm and that you have some plan for how to respond to that in case there is civilian harm, either to property or to, to persons, including providing some form of redress for people who may lose members of their family, lose property, and so on. Yeah, uh, either Major Brazier or Squadron Leader Tinkler, uh, do you want to talk through just for a minute our ex payment plan? Because um, that's something that we've been, I think, pretty uh, have well established at this point in terms of our standard uh, ways of ensuring that we um, compensate the local population whenever we do have um, a situation where uh, our, our uh, efforts have um, negatively impacted them financially. Yeah, ma'am, I'm happy to address that real, uh, real quickly. Um, and, and certainly no surprise to Andrea and Mark uh, that we do have uh, teams uh, that follow in behind an infantry attack, and um, it's you know really a, a, a two-way street. Is one we're looking uh, looking to find uh, those uh, civilians that have been affected um, by the combat operations um, and determine the, the level of harm, um, and we're also looking um, for those civilians, and we have a number of ways to communicate to the battalion uh, to, uh, to identify civilian harm. Um, and certainly that often comes through the humanitarian organizations that you represent. So we, we do appreciate that. Um, and then we do an investigation and in appropriate cases, um, although not required as a matter of law, we often provide ex gratia payments, uh, often referred to as condolent payments uh, to the family as a show of respect. Um, and 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 a sign of regret um, on on the part of uh, uh, the combat operations that we've been conducting. So I think that's just a, a quick overview of kind of how we do that. Thanks, Major Brazier. Um, so I think we've only got a couple more minutes. I apologize. I'm going to have to head off to my next meeting. Uh, Andrea and Mark, do you have any other topics that uh, we need to take into our consideration as we plan this uh, assault? Um, oh, thanks, uh, to, sorry, oh, sorry, go ahead, Mark. Please, Mark. Just a quick point to add to add from my side still that, of course, we appreciate the challenges you're facing in, in this situation. Um, but yes, what, what the, the major just mentioned, just to underline that, you know, if, if you can really uh, proactively also yourself track any, any harm, any incidents of harm or any patterns of harm that you might be causing uh, lawfully or unlawfully to, to be able to learn from that uh, and really uh, 
bring that into your planning also going forward, and then also to use that information to, to make amends or to, of course, trigger investigations depending on, on the case. So just to underline that and to commend you for, for that effort, because it's crucial to, to prevent harm in the, in the future as well. I know we only have a couple minutes, Colonel Rodman, and you have heard from us on this issue before, so I'm just going to flag it and say we are very open for future conversations. But I want to highlight the fact that you may ultimately be detaining people in the course of your operation, and there are very important specific requirements pertaining to that. So again, we're happy to talk about that in the future. Just really urge you that if you don't have a thorough plan to deal with both short-term and potentially long-term detention, that's something that you need to be looking at right away. Got it. Thank you. Um, well, Andrea and Mark, I, I can't thank you enough. This meeting has been really excellent. Um, and I appreciate you highlighting the humanitarian concerns regarding our upcoming operations. I will absolutely consider what you've told me as the battalion continues to operate in an incredibly difficult combat setting. And I hope this won't be our last meeting. I, I hope we can really sustain this relationship and maybe talk once again, once the coalition um, is really in control of the city of Lieberville. Thanks again for your time. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, uh, Major Brazier and Squadron Leader Tinkler, if you've got a couple more minutes, I'd, I'd like to talk through what we just heard. Uh, well, let's start with initial impressions. What do you guys think? Yeah, thanks, ma'am, I'll start. Um, so uh, yeah, no surprise, Andrea and Mark and the rest of the humanitarian have identified some of the key challenges that we have going into this final operation in the South. Um, I do wanna note that I, 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 I think we benefit um, from continuing our dialogue with, with Andrea and Mark and the other organizations on the battlefield because, um, you know, it's, it's helpful to remember that a lot of these organizations have been here in Libreville since the last U.S. intervention in 1998, and they bring a ton of, uh, ton of knowledge. Um, we, of course, have our uh, challenges in different legal interpretations, um, and I'll get into a few of those in a few minutes. But ultimately, um, there, you know, we're as interested in protecting civilians and their property uh, almost as much, uh, maybe as much as the humanitarian organizations. That's part of who we are. Um, so no surprise that they've raised a few of them. No, nothing, uh, no flags, red flags for me on on what they have to say. So, so back to you, ma'am. Okay, great. Um, uh, Squadron Leader Tinkler, any any big red flags, or should we just jump into the legal discussion? Thanks, Paul. Well, no, no red flags for me. Um, all valid questions, you know, and, and detention plans, etc., um, should already be in place. Um, just to confirm that there was nothing really from that meeting in terms of uh, informing civilian pattern of life. Um, so, if anything in addition to what we have comes from uh, NGOs, we'll factor that into the analysis. Yeah. Thank you. Um, okay. Great. Well, I'd I'd really like to just talk through the legal questions really quick on the infantry assault on the city. I think we need to kind of unpack that a little bit. Major Brazier, I'm really interested in your thoughts there. And then Squadron Leader Tinkler, since uh, UK coalition forces are going to be in charge of the air assault on the bridge, I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. Um, maybe uh, Major Brazier, we'll start with you. Thanks, ma'am. Okay, um, you know, getting started, I'll review a couple of the, uh, the major uh, legal points here as a refresher. Um, um, but, you know, I, I recall there was a, a one page memo that you issued your commander's guidance on uh, the law of armed conflict and the importance of um, that the law of armed conflict is part of any given mission. Um, I really uh, think that that's an important um, thing to discuss and maybe, maybe republish with your subordinate commanders and non-commissioned officers. Um, because it, it talks about not only the law of armed conflict, but kind of the underpinning moral, legal, and you know ethical um, principles of that, and ultimately behaving honorable in conduct. And I think it might be worth a refresh if you're up for that, ma'am. Uh, certainly, um, uh, Squadron Leader uh, Tinkler and I, we often raise that as one of the ways to start off when we're conducting our kind of small unit training as we move around. Um, so. So jumping into kind of uh, some of the legal points that I'll address really um, related to the, uh, the urban attack that we're gonna see in a few days. Um, and that is your infantry battalion um, moving toward the strong points that the enemy have established. And 
um, in advance of that infantry battalion arriving at those strong points, your intent is to bring in uh, mortars, artillery, and airstrikes, uh, you know, to keep the, well, one, to destroy the enemy and, and their strong points. Um, and those that are not, uh, that are not killed or wounded, uh, we intend to keep their head down. And I think uh, certainly the indirect fire and the close air support that you envision um, uh, may be effective. But, but let's talk about the legal aspects of, of that approach. Um, so I think when we look at, um, we start, we've talked about this with the humanitarians already, is the importance of distinction. Distinction is that legal principle uh, required to be applied in this and every single attack where uh, we must distinguish between the enemy, enemy property, and civilians and civilian properties. Um, we know that, that, that only uh, military objectives uh, may be attacked in an armed conflict, and a military uh, attack, a, a military objective is any object which by its nature, location, purpose, or use makes an effective contribution to the enemy's effort and whose partial uh, total uh, capture neutralization in the circumstances ruling at the time offers a definite military advantage to you and your battalion. So that's kind of upfront uh, distinction, military objective. I'm glad you brought positive identification or PID and uh, pattern of life. That Those are some of the methods that we use in making sure that we're following uh, the principle of distinction and only targeting military objectives. Um, all right, let's get into um, let's get in some of the things that that Andrea and Mark raised. They use the term DPH, right? And um, that is really referring to a term uh, of a direct participation in hostilities or directly participating in hostilities. Depends on who you talk to. They use a little bit different language, but it's DPH, and this is the scenario that we've encountered since we arrived. Um, it, is, uh, it has been a feature of the conflicts in Iraq, Afghanistan, Vietnam. This is what Andrew was talking about, the fighter by day, uh, excuse me, the, the farmer by day and the fighter by night. Um, and Andrea brought up one of the sticking points that, that the US has with regard to many um, humanitarian definitions of this principle is that um, they fight, 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 they drop their weapon and run away, and they do this over a period of days. There are many people believe, many organizations and, and some, some of the more modern militaries around the world believe that when they've dropped their weapons and run away, they are no longer targeted. For that period of time- Did I hear her right that she's saying that we can't target someone who just shot at us? Because I, I want to understand this a little bit better. Um, well, she um, she didn't say that, I don't recall specifically, but it raises the point that they have a perception that is much different than ours, that even if you have a pattern of participation in hostilities as a civilian, that um, even though you, we have an established pattern of an individual or group's participation and then uh, going back to their, their daily business, um, that uh, under their interpretation, they, during their, you know, uh, farmer by day or business person during the day, that they are not um, subject to attack. That is not, not our legal interpretation, ma'am, under the United States, in the United States. Um, our interpretation is, and, and what that is referred to, and, and this is often discussed, and I know we've talked about it, is this revolving door. You get to shoot at us, you go back to your business, you get to shoot at us, and that part of when you're not shooting at us, you're you're safe, and that's not our 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 U.S. position. Um, for uh, when we generally establish a pattern of uh, civilians participating in hostilities, they have um, either uh, we would consider them they have joined the non-state armed group that is resident uh, in southern uh, Libreville. Um, or that they have behaved in such a way over a period of time that it's not isolated instances and that they are targetable, even though they're not instant if simultaneously uh, attacking us at a particular time. So, so that's our 
our interpretation, the U.S. doesn't buy into the revolving door, um, and that's important. So the one time- uh, Squadron Leader Tinkler, is that going to cause any issues for us on the air side? Um, do you guys have any kind of uh, alternative view on this, or are we all military interpretations the same across the board? Yeah, thanks, Mom. So um, given the enemy is an organized armed group, um, what I would say is that um, in theory, at least, uh, if you can if you can say that someone is um, is a member, then it doesn't matter whether they're they're DPHing or not. You can target them. Um, the difficulty in in a, in a dynamic environment like where we're entering is how do you determine that? Um, and often you'll be able to determine that by if someone is actually DPHing. Um, so if we think that someone's a member of an organised armed group, it doesn't matter if they're DPHing or not. Um, so that's the kind of bottom line. In terms of was an issue from an air support perspective, uh, if, we, if we're targeting a building based on its its function, who's in there, um, then the distinction issue is, is being addressed. It will be a question of potentially a question of what civilian harm is occurring. Um, but, but that's the kind of the, the general overview. Okay, thank you. That, that's a big help. Uh, Major Brazier, please continue. Thanks, ma'am. So, um, so we've touched a couple a couple of points uh, that 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 Andrea and Mark brought up. Um, let's talk about. Um, I think the greatest opportunity, as you described it, to kill the enemy through the use of kind of the preparatory mortars, uh, artillery, and uh, the airstrikes on the strong points in southern Libreville, um, that that provides you, as you described the greatest opportunity to kill and degrade the enemy. And to, to really, you know, we know that, that Libreville has been a tough fight. We've been fighting in the North. This is the last pocket. So um, we appreciate how important this is. Um, and you've, you've articulated your commander's intent to use these, this indirect fire and close air support, speed shock and surprise to take the enemy uh, off guard um, and really come in with some, I think, shock and law uh, you, you talked about uh, earlier. Um, that also, that approach may be also present the greatest risk to the civilians that are in the adjacent buildings and perhaps in the very buildings. So, so what, what does the law require you to think about? Um, what precautions uh, and what, how do you think about proportionality? So, so let's, let's talk about that a little bit. Um, one of the first things, again, re resurfacing, that civilians under the law of armed conflict may not be targeted. They must be protected. And one of the things that, that we talk about in the law of armed conflict are indiscriminate weapons. Weapons that um, uh, they must, uh, all weapons must be capable of being directed at a military objective. Um, and indiscriminate weapons include those that would be as likely to hit civilians as combatants. So when you are thinking about those precautions, uh, weapons choice, time of day of the attack, um, when are the civilians in, in that part of the city, what time of day are they moving around the most? And we know this because of our pattern of life analysis uh, for our intelligence folks uh, over the last uh, couple of weeks as we've been pre preparing for this attack. All of those things that you are required to think about and factor in. So. Um, when we talk about uh, indiscriminate weapons and noting that the strong points are concrete buildings, two to four stories, and that there are a lot of adjacent buildings that are clearly not strong points and from what we can tell are not occupied by the, the enemy, they are occupied by the civilian population. Um, so, you know, if we look at real quickly, um, we know we have 81 millimeter mortars. We have uh, four, uh, four mortar tubes there. Um, and that's pretty helpful. And we certainly control those at your level. They're organic to your battalion. Above you, uh, we know that UK provides artillery and air support uh, through the capable um, you know, legal review uh, provided by uh, squad leader Tinkler. And look at, so let's start with the 80 millimeter mortars, 35 millimeter effective casualty, uh, excuse me, 35 meters effective casualty ratings. So, as you think about hitting those buildings, you have about 35 meters of about 100 feet uh, that that is going to have a blast radius. When we go up to the 155 millimeter 
artillery rounds. That's a 50 meter radius. And then when we get into some of the heavier um, aviation fires, some of those uh, bombs that may be potentially used um, could have, you know, um, blast radius of 200 to 400 meters. Um, and, and finally, when we look at some of the aviation and, and some of the, uh, the drone uh, capabilities, you know, the Hellfire missile to contrast with the heavier aviation loads um, is about a 15 meter radius. So as you think about that attack, I think it's really important that you decide where you're comfortable on distinction, uh, whether um, you're going to use something so big that it may be viewed as indiscriminate, um, and then really focusing on that proportionality requirement, the law of armed conflict, which is one of excessiveness, that the expected harm to civilians and their civilian structures in Libreville um, are not excessive in relate, relation to what you hope to gain militarily. And I know that's a difficult balancing uh, point for you. So let me stop there, ma'am, and see if you have any follow-up questions before I talk with, about precautions. Yeah, I mean, I mean, there's no question we need indirect fires before we go in. The, the, I mean, our, our scheme of maneuver absolutely requires it. And I think, you know, we need to put the enemy in that kind of a dilemma in order to assure our success in this, in this mission. I'm, I'm gratified to hear that you've heard my commander's intent and thank you so much for so clearly articulating it. That, that is a, a big help and it means a lot. Um, I, I think I'm hearing from you that the mortars are probably good um, artillery might cause us some problems. I don't see any civilian structures that are clearly within 50 meters, although let's go back, look at the map and see what we can find. Um, and then let's see if we can do some weaponeering on this. I think some of our CAS assets, and we can talk to squadron leader Tinkler about this too, we might be able to do some fusing or some other weaponeering that gets us a little bit more precision. Um, and if we can't, we can't. I, I think, you know, we've certainly done this kind of work before with just mortars and maybe some artillery. Um, I, I really do want that firepower. I, I don't want to put our guys in jeopardy. Um, uh, and, you know, like our mission success and our troop welfare is among my absolute top priorities, as you know that, um, if not the absolute top. We really want to protect those civilians, and you know that I'm committed to that, but, um, you know, mission accomplishment, troop welfare. So, um, so maybe after this, uh, we'll we'll have to maybe head over to the G3 and, and talk to some of the fires guys and take a look at some of our weapons options and see see what kind of real options are on the table. So thanks for flagging that, uh, Major Brazier, and uh, I'm hopeful we can come up with a solution that gives us the firepower we need, but um, but also takes into account some of your considerations. Yeah, thanks, ma'am. Um, I'm I'm about done and uh, ready for uh, Tinkler's discussion of the bridge. But last couple of things we, we I wanted to talk about. We've talked about distinction proportionality, um, and uh, but some of the precautions that have already been built into some of our discussion. You know, really kind of walking through and refreshing that some of the precautions that you, you are required to take is the verify that a target is military objective. We've gone through that choice of we weapons. We've just talked about that. Adjusting the time of attack may be uh, something that you, uh, you may consider. Um, one of the things we haven't talked about is continuous evaluation of attack. This has been a part of that dialogue, but also um, your, your requirement uh, to cancel or suspend an attack if some of the criteria that we've talked about are not met. Um, so we have this continuous ongoing, even from the, the, the minute that the bombs start dropping um, is, is um, as we all know in the operations center, it's a continuous evaluation uh, requirement um, and facts change. And when they do, if that causes you to be concerned about some of the, uh, the principles and legal rules we've been talking about, uh, that would be important. And lastly, I'll wrap up um, with, with one of the warnings as being one of the requirements, um, um, unless circumstances do not permit. So I think generally we know, uh, we've talked about the, uh, some of the leaflets and pamphlets and the engagement with the key leaders in, in Southern Libreville. So I think, you know, from my perspective, we've done a really good job with the warnings. Um, you may consider uh, a final warning before the attack happens, but if, you know, the surprise is really, really uh, paramount to you, when you kick off this assault, the law does not require you to surrender surprise uh, in order to provide an effective warning to the civilian population. Um, 
So I think that's it. And that stitches a lot of our um, legal requirements together. And unless you have any questions, ma'am, I'll, uh, I'll uh, turn it over to the next portion of the brief. All right. Yeah, no, I, I mean, in terms of that continuous evaluation, Major Brazier, I think, you know, once we kick off, I'm going to need you in the COC because that's going to be something I'm going to need your help with. You need, you know, I, I want that flag if, if we need to be considering something that I'm not seeing. Um, of course, I'm not interested in canceling this attack. We don't have to, but we'll do the right thing if we've got to do the right thing. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I, I'm hearing also that maybe we need to go talk to our info ops folks and just understand a little bit better about the kinds of warnings that we've been giving the civilian population thus far. And if we can thread that needle, making sure that we don't ruin the ultimate surprise of the attack. But I, I think folks know something's coming. So we can double down on that a little bit and make sure we get the message out that it'd be wise to clear the area. Um, all right. Uh, thank you, Major Brazier. Uh, Squadron Leader Tinkler, um, maybe we should turn to the bridge with the time that we've got left before um, uh, before we need to jet out and uh, get your thoughts on um, the close air support option that we have from the UK for that effort. Sure, thanks, Bob. So in terms of the bridge, there, there are three main issues, uh, as already mentioned uh, previously, distinction, precautions, proportionality, um, and, and in, in that order. So focusing first on distinction, um, the question is, is this a military objective? And Ian set out the test. Now, the, the bridge isn't currently being used by the enemy, so the, the, use, the use criterion is, is irrelevant here. So it, by nature, location, or purpose, um, does this bridge effectively contribute to military action? Um, I don't take the position that by nature, this bridge would, um, would be a military objective, but that, that is not an unreasonable position to take if you previously had that advice from your, your US military personnel. Um, what I'd like to check with you is that um, my understanding currently is that the enemy uh, may use the bridge. Do we have any further information on, on how likely that, that is? I'm making that assessment based on my, uh, on, you know, us and, and our planners have looked at this question and it is the enemy's most likely course of action. The enemy has been in these positions for a while, so I don't know that we've seen them necessarily running south, but that's where we want to push them. So, um, so, you know, I, I don't know that for sure, but I, it is my 99% guess about where they might go. And certainly because of the way that we're going to be moving into the city, I'm not sure where else they could possibly egress to. And if we're going to make this an effective assault, then we need to remove that option. Yeah, sure. That, I mean, that makes make sense to me. It's always useful to get it confirmed by a, by a senior officer. So um, based on that assessment, I think it's a reasonable determination. This is a military objective by, by either purpose or location. Um, clearly denying that that bridge would effectively, um, you know, that bridge would effectively contribute to, to the enemy. Um, in terms of definite military advantage, that is something that can be for the US or the UK. So we're in a coalition operation. It's not restricted to, to one or the other. So fairly comfortable that the bridge is a, something that can be struck subject to the other rules and targeting. So then looking at precautions and attack, the first thing just to, to highlight to you, Mom, uh, we've done a bit of due diligence and this bridge isn't, for example, a, a culturally significant bridge, uh, which would give rise to special protection um, in terms of you know, precautions and verification of target. Um, one of the big issues here is, is the kind of choice of means and methods. So, um, I know you talked previously about the potential to use um, forces, you know, over in, in another city. Um, so just to be clear, precautions and attack require you to do what's um, reasonably practicable or feasible. Um, so my understanding is that if you were to try and bring forces over, uh, friendly forces uh, from a different battalion over to control the bridge as opposed to destroy the bridge, and that would have a, a quite harmful effect on ops. Could you just confirm that to me? That'd be useful. Yeah, I mean, Second Battalion has armored vehicles um, and we could make the ask, but with 48 hours to go and knowing, I mean, you you guys are aware of the kinetics that they're engaging in in, in just the next town over. I don't think it's gonna be a reasonable request. And I really am I'm not inclined to degrade our military effectiveness one town over um, just to facilitate an option here. Uh, I mean, if you tell me it's a legal requirement, then we'll look into it. But if we've got some other options, I think I'd prefer to look there first. No, it, it, it's not a legal requirement. So for feasibility, um, as interpreted uh, by 
by the US, by the UK, etc. Uh, that doesn't require you to forgo a military advantage. Uh, you just have to do what's feasible to, to minimize harm. So, so that wouldn't require you to move forces, certainly in these circumstances, that's quite clear. Um, a, di a different alternative potentially someone mentioned to me was um, creating the road ahead of the bridge. Now, from my perspective, that wouldn't get the job done because you might stop uh, mechanized forces and vehicles getting into the city, but you wouldn't stop personnel um, bleeding through. So um, unless you disagree, um, my assessment is that um, th these sort of alter alternative covers don't, don't get the job done and therefore you're not required to do those. Yeah, I, I mean, the enemy is not dangerous in this scenario because it's a mechanized enemy, right? I mean, we, right. what we really need to do is, um, is to clear the enemy from this city. And if we're just pushing them out across the bridge, we're, we're creating a problem for us tomorrow that we can solve today. So um, I don't know. I, I, I mean, I don't mind the idea of figuring out how to crater if we knew that it would stop the egress. Um, but I, I'm not convinced. Uh, maybe if we can develop that a little more and if that becomes a real option, let's come back to it. But uh, yeah, it doesn't seem practical to me, Mom, but I, I just flag it for, for your awareness in case you, you know you took a different view. Um, in terms of timing, a pattern of life analysis so far uh, strongly indicates that the civilians are not using the bridge. That shines with common sense, given that the enemy um, has, has stopped civilians leaving the city, uh, which is obviously causing diff diff different issues. Um, so why do I mention that? If, for example, we knew the civilians were using it by day, but not at night, that might be something we'd have to think about in terms of the timing of the attack. Um, but at the moment, that, that's a non-factor, but I, I just raise it for completeness. Um, so, so that's the, the, the main precautionary stuff, other than the warnings. So, so Ian's mentioned warnings previously. Now, one thing that uh, has been considered recently is, would it be feasible to give some kind of warning for civilians to not try and exit the city via the, via the bridge? Because obviously, if they do manage to get out, despite the enemy trying to keep them pen, penned in, we would rather, it, it's no, not a good scenario for them to, to move south, assuming they can use the bridge for that purpose. So, um, as Ian set out, it's, the test is effective warning unless the circumstances do not permit. Now, in my interpretation of the law, um, if you think tipping your hat to the enemy um, of you're going to blow the bridge up it is uh, problematic, then you won't have to give that warning. But um, that would, you know, that would be the, the last resort. I think it would be good if we could give that warning if at all possible. Yeah, let's let's talk for our info ops folks um, after this. Uh, yeah, Major Brazier. Yeah, ma'am. Hey, you know, one of the things uh, since we uh, since I started working for you in the pre-deployment phase um, that you've always pressed me on, and it, I think it helps me make me, uh, me a better lawyer is you always ask me the question, "What does the law require?" And I think um, Squadron Leader uh, Tinkler has laid out in, in certainly some of my discussions on distinction, proportionality, and precautions in attack are what's required. But what is required here for you is to consider the multitude of factors and that you ruled out certain um, approaches because they were not feasible. So that's the simple, broad requirement that you have as a commander in conducting this attack. Um, and we've already talked through um, the multitude of factors that you've considered. And many of them, I think you're headed toward ruling them out because they are not feasible. Um, you've looked at destroying the bridge, cordoning off the bridge. You've heard from um, uh, Tinkler that maybe cratering the road. Uh, and I know that we've talked about this before and I've had discussions with our operations section as whether, um, whether it might be useful um, if the enemy is is um, using that road leading up to the bridge uh, to reinforce the forces that you have under attack in southern Libreville, maybe is that an opportunity to kill the enemy in the open? So, um, but you know, one of the things as you think about proportionality here too, and what what might be ex excessive civilian harm um, um, as compared with the military advantage is. Some of the things that the humanitarians have told us about this bridge is that one, it's a bridge, it's the main bridge um, that can provide um, certainly enemy reinforcement, but the escape of the civilian population from the conflict, and that's important. That not only is the bridge used to trap, uh, you know, to go over this span, um, 
is that it carries, uh, you know, conduits for water, fresh water to Southern Libreville, electricity to water uh, to to Southern Libreville, and this is one of the main areas for the humanitarian aid community to get in after the fight. So there's a lot riding on this bridge, but but you've, I think the fact that we've had this discussion means you, you are meeting your legal obligations to think carefully about it. All right. Um, I do, I do want to go talk to our info ops folks. I, I mean, we've done this before. Like we can let the civilians know they need to get out of Dodge. Um, and so we'll, we'll figure out the right way to send that message. I don't think we need to tell them the bridge is going away if we just tell them to get out of Dodge. Um, so let's see if we can figure that out. Um, all right. Um, so we've got, we've got a couple, uh, to do's from here. Um, I've got, uh, major Brazier. Um, I think we're going to go talk some, some weaponeering and some fuses with some folks to figure out what we can do, um, on the indirect fires question. Um, squadron leader Tinkler, let's look into this cratering option and just triple check that we're good to go. And I'm going to get some more information on the the package on the bridge because I don't think that we've got clear information about the water and the utilities right now. Uh, I don't know that um, we know that for sure. And, and we do want to know that before we make a decision. Um, all right, I've got two more questions that I just wanted to clear and, and sorry, and the info ops, um, we'll make sure to go to info ops after this as well. So I've got those three. Um, all right, two more questions that I want to handle. One, uh, Moody Jabrazier, you mentioned at the beginning, uh, maybe re reissuing my memo. Um, thank you for reading it. Um, thank you for drafting it. Um, it was excellent, as you know. Um, and uh, I kind of want to talk to you about whether you think that will be more effective or if we, frankly, just need to do another small unit training and get you in front of the guys and explain to them everything that you just explained to me. Because um, I'll be honest, uh, this is not, I, I want to make sure that they get it. And I don't know that they're going to read a piece of paper. Well, ma'am, haven't been in this situation before. When I stand in front of our uh, our soldiers, um, it is a great deal different than when you stand in front of them. So to the extent that you can circulate throughout all the units and, and talk with everybody about uh, how important the honorable uh, behavior is in this, this, what we anticipate will be our final attack for this deployment and how important it is to protect the civilians, um, and how important it is to, to kill the enemy and, and balance those factors that the law really talks about. So um, you could use a combination of methods, ma'am, uh, uh, that I think, you know, you could reissue the memo. Um, you could, but I think the most powerful um, thing that you could do is get in front of every soldier that you can and talk about how important that is to keep their honor clean. That's all I have, ma'am. Thank you. All right, um, and then there was that one last question that uh, Andrea asked at the end of um, that session about detention. Major Brazier, you're on that, right? Yes, ma'am. Uh, you know, we're, you know, obviously the operations folks are, are leading the detention uh, planning, um, and I'm certainly plugged into that effort. But uh, you, you know, I think uh, our detention plan is fairly mature. Okay, I'm I'm going to want you to make sure that that stays within our legal parameters, and if you can take charge of making sure our detention operations are fully planned, that'd be great. Um, all right, uh, I really appreciate this. Thank you very much. I think we've got our due outs from here. Um, we've got about 48 hours to go, and I think we can get a successful mission accomplished. So thank you, gentlemen, for your advice and your time, and uh, see you soon. Out. Thank you, ma'am.